Thank you, Candice. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for the opportunity to present uh, tonight. Uh, we'll be talking about something quite important, right? So our role in to making the world a better place. Um, we all part of the same human family, and I think it's uh, it's one of the most important efforts, most important uh, things we can do uh, together. And we'll show you something uh, what we think it's uh, is helping or could help uh, reaching uh, the goals that we we set ourselves to be um, to to prevent disaster in in uh, in the future. So. I mute myself. Hey, so I'm Alessandro and Marino is with me. Uh, so we work for a company called Solo.io. We do love Istio, service meshes, of course. And uh, we are a company very dedicated to, to advance open source, to advance uh, the adoption of service mesh. And, uh, and while we do that, we also want to uh, share uh, how can we also look at the consumption, the resources that we consume uh, with our software while we are uh, solving the application networking problem uh, that, that that is. Uh, do you want to introduce yourself, Marino, before we go Absolutely, we go yeah. Yeah. Hey, everyone. My name is Marino Wijay. I am a principal developer advocate at Solo. And much like Alessandro said, uh, a lot of our focus is around the open source application networking space. And well, why a lot of this is important to me is because I come from a network engineering background and to see a lot of the sustainability efforts make its way into cloud environments, data centers, and even cloud native is, is very exciting. So, you know, I hope we get to cover some deep technical details while also talking about the sustainability side of what we do in cloud native. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, the, the, the angle of networking, it's maybe overlooked when we talk about uh, um, sustainability of software, but we, I'm confident that we will also start talking about it. So we always talk about compute and uh, and uh, big batch computation when we talk about consumption of resources when it comes to software, but networking plays a big role. And we, Marino has a um, track history on this. We have networking foundation workshops we will share later on uh, so i hope we will see more about networking impact impact of networking in uh, sustainability so this talk and uh, allow me to to digress a, a little bit it's important for me it's, i think it's important for a lot of people we are here and we are part of the same uh the same human family i think and uh it's this talk is about the choices you can make today uh what you can do uh, to impact the course of um, of what is going on in, 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 in on the planet. So we all know that we are at a crucial point in history. So what we do this decade is, is going to matter for the next uh, centuries. Uh, so and this is the moment we all have to come together. And uh, nobody nobody is excluded. Nobody is left out. Nobody. Everybody has a has something. To do and to say about this, and we are we are here to to talk about some of those choices, right? So this very dear to me, uh, this topic because I found this interesting uh, graph. This is what this was from an MIT uh, paper from 1973, and it was about prediction of where are we going as a species, right? So where where are we going as a society, um, and what can we do to to build a better future right so if you look at this graph you see that in in many projection this is from 1973 and i know some people have some different opinion on this and it's been of course like uh, also partially debunked uh but yeah if population grows and consumption doesn't uh doesn't seems to stop of course there is a point in time where uh things stop right so that that's if we keep going business as usual this is the business as usual uh, scenario where we just increment the the amount of resources we consume we don't do anything about our um uh the consumption of uh, of uh, oil and gas and uh, non-renewable energy sources that's where we're going we're gonna reach a point where there is not much to not much oil not much more oil to burn not much uh 
resources to consume and will rapidly decline. Uh, population will also decline. And we're not gonna. Be, it's gonna be a bad place for everybody to be in. So, so what can what is about? Are we really going there? Can we do something about it? Is there a, a way uh, to do to do something about it? So yes, as a Cloud Native Computing Foundation, I'm an ambassador for the CNCF. Been around for a long time. I consider the foundation as a, uh, almost like a family to me. That is. Air Force, right? So there's there's a uh, uh, item awareness of these topics. So we do have now uh, for about a year a technical advisory group about sustainability. I encourage everybody to join. It's a, it's open group that specifically analyzes and thinks about uh, the the consumption models and the, how the software we lo all love and care, the open source software under the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Um, thinks about or co consider uh, the resource consumption and so on. So it's an open group. And I encourage everybody to to join. Uh, we do meetups. We do meet every week. Um, we will have special uh, meetings during Kubecons as we had um, in Chicago a couple of weeks, a few weeks ago. So it's an open group, and I. Uh, and some of the things that we discuss, we talk about, of course, is the the software carbon intensity, right? So how much how much carbon equivalent is produced per unit of computation, which is the crux of the of the problem, right? So this is the the mantra what everybody's trying to to optimize. So how can you emit less while keeping the same amount of computation we all know software is eating the world or has been eating the world for a, for decades now world runs on software so we are not advocating for reducing the the amount of computation needed because of course we we also need that that computing power to solve uh humanity's problems and uh, and to uh, live more comfortably but what we are saying as a, as a advocates for sustainability is that that amount of computation should um should produce less carbon less co2 so we can reach the goals that we we set up so there's also a interesting um uh, course from the green software foundation about this and i encourage you to to look it up and come to the um to the um, tag environmental sustainability to discuss about it so what is ambient and uh, it's interesting uh, that's why it triggered me um talking about ambient mesh and environment because in italian ambient uh, environment is is spelled like ambient right so uh, if there's any italian here so when we call it uh protezione ambientale uh, like an environmental protection in italian is spelled exactly like ambient so for me it's uh, those two words are quite equivalent so why, why am i talking about ambient so and you can tell uh, that we love open source and specifically in our uh, in our daily daily job of course we we deal with a lot of uh, um uh, application networking so we aim to solve some of the most thorny uh, um issues when you deal with microservices cloud native architectures namely the networking the security that comes the complexity that comes with the running distributed microservices and one way and our way to solve it is to use a service mesh, right? So a service mesh is this architecture that uh, classically injects sidecar proxies very close to the application so you can control the traffic coming in and out of your of your application pods. Um, this has been a around for a while. It's, uh, it's what we consider like the golden standard for, uh, for service mesh. Uh, Many service meshes in within CNCF and on the, on the market, they do use this architecture, but it's not the only one. Uh, there is, uh, um, we say that um, we listen to customers, of course, to end users of service mesh of Istio in particular, and then uh, the community came together and said there is another way. There are better ways to do the same thing, the same control to achieve the same degree of control and security uh, and and and, uh, and observability of your application um, without wasting compute cycles in sidecars. So short intro about Istio, it's been around for uh, quite some time, almost the same 
time that as as Kubernetes and CF has been around. Uh, it wasn't part of CNCF for for a few years, but recently it's been donated and effectively now is one of the largest and most popular uh, project within within uh, within uh, uh, the, the CNCF is being donated has been also um, uh, promoted to graduated so it's a graduated production ready service mesh and recently not even a year ago we introduced the ambient mode for uh, for service for istio mesh what it is so it's a new architecture where we get away with the sidecars. So we don't deploy sidecars uh, per application, per po application pod. And instead we use a sidecar per node uh, architecture. So what do you achieve with that? Uh, simplify operation, you have less moving parts, um, better performance. We are in the process of uh, establishing also uh, um, uh, baseline performance for, uh, for ambient. But definitely, and this is the, 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 uh, why we are here talking about the ambient, because there's less moving parts. You, you literally running less uh, containers, less, uh, less compute. You will eventually, you will get less consumption. And this will save you from emitting uh, and consuming energy and eventually emitting less, um, less CO2. So it will improve the software carbon intensity, it will reduce the software carbon intensity of your mesh enabled uh, architecture. So how does it work very broadly? Um, say that you have a classic sidecar proxy uh, architecture and you want to migrate to ambient mesh, that's simple as removing all the proxies or uh, not even deploying them if you start from 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 scratch if you have a greenfield deployment but having a proxy per node so you can tell from this simple picture that you go from uh, i don't know two four six uh, 18 proxies to one right so and this will reduce considerably your uh your carbon footprint um you can say sure that proxy per node needs to be a bit bigger uh, needs to handle more uh, more connection, that's for sure. But being a specialized proxy and uh, part of the move to ambient was also to split the layer four and layer seven. If you know the OSI layer, I'm talking about the TCP connection, uh, which is performed by the, the proxy per node um, versus the layer seven, which is the HTTP connection handling, which also means uh, the uh, all the sophisticated layer seven policy and uh, and uh, traffic routing that comes with that. So when you split these two and you put the proxy on the node to do the job of layer four uh, connection, that will make it more simple, uh, which also, also enable the Istio community to rewrite the proxy in Rust, which is not obviously uh, very efficient um, uh, programming language. Uh, so the, the proxy is now written in Rust, while the layer seven is still um, still the the trustworthy envoy proxy. So we also have, of course, our own uh, implementation of that is based on the open source. And basically, what we are to what we are saying here is that we replace the proxies with what we call it Z-Tunnel, which is this node-based proxy. And the proxy will uh, form a, a mesh as well, a mesh between the, the nodes. So you get exactly the same features without the burden of running many, many, many uh, proxy sidecars. And so after all, after, this is something we, we're not going to talk about, we wanted to skip this, but um, uh, this is the waypoint proxy, which is the layer seven, dedicated layer seven proxy that will only handle the communication for the application that do need layer seven um, handling of connection. So if you don't need it, there's no waypoint proxy and uh, you'll be happy with just the Z tunnel. And if you want to do a layer seven, you just have to deploy one proxy, but there's not one proxy per pod per application is one pod per one waypoint proxy per um, um, per, per application, per, per uh, workload identity. I'm not gonna go into detail here, but it's for service account really. Um, 
and also helps with adoption because you don't need to restart any application. You just deploy the Z tunnel and, uh, and, and Istio and you onboard the application as you see fit, as you uh, move uh, with the adoption uh, to the uh, into the mesh. So, and of course, still can work with sidecars as well. So you don't need to just all of a sudden uh change everything and then start using mbmbh it's a it's a gradual progressive adoption of um of this um, of service mesh so what is what does it mean for your wallet right so that you go from a cycle model where you have an in very quite intense uh and, and quite invasive as well because you got these proxies really injected into your application uh, and they do consume memory and uh, and CPU, of course, because they even if they sit there, they do have to uh, handle every connection in and out of your application uh, to a situation where you have ambient. And even if you have uh, the waypoint proxy deployed, you still have quite a significant uh, reduction in in usage. So this is important for your wallet, but also for the planet, right? So you are reducing, keeping the same the same functionalities, you are still be able to um, to perform uh, very sophisticated, uh, for example, application tracing or uh, or layer seven um, processing of your uh, of your request, while keeping the resources to a minimum, and while keeping, of course, the uh, the resource consumption to to a low. Uh, Low, low amount. So this is a projection, right? So this is not, uh, it's not science, of course, but if you imagine without any proxy, without any service mesh, it's the blue line and you grow your application, you move on and you, you are successful, your application is being adopted left and right and you start to scale up to a thousand nodes and you have 50, node, 50 pod per node, you scale linearly, right? So you go up uh, up uh, uh, by the factor of 50 pods per node. If you have sidecars, every pod also brings in no another container with the, with the Envoy proxy. So it scales faster than the amount of nodes required by your application, by the amount of pods required by your application. While with the, with the ambient, there is an overhead. It's one proxy, one pod uh, per node but it's not the same overhead as you would have with the cycle. So even if you scale your application, if you go where um, everybody wants to be, right? So we made such a great application that everybody wants to use them. We need to scale, but we, we are not victim of our own success and we can still handle, um, handle the, uh, the, the, the resource consumption of your, of our application. So, so that, that's, uh, that, that's my idea. That's uh, that's what we wanted to share uh, to share about ambient mesh. And uh, please, Marino, if you want to take it from here. Yeah. So thank you so much for sharing a lot of that information, Alessandro. But before we continue, there were some questions that came up in the QA, and I'll go ahead and answer them live. But let me go ahead and ask the questions. When a node restarts, how do you guarantee that the per node uh, proxy comes after the application pods? If that makes sense. So one of the considerations, Kareem, about the proxy itself, specifically Z-Tunnel, we, we don't want to consider it as a node proxy per se. It's more of a remote proxy because applications or workloads that need to be able to communicate with other workloads in the mesh just need to have a, a, much very, a very much local Z-Tunnel available to them. I mean, it technically doesn't have to live on the same node, but the preference would be the same node only because it cuts back on latency and unnecessary hops. But here's the other consideration as well. If your node restarts, Kubernetes knows about that. So Kubernetes will work to actually redeploy the application before that node comes online. It'll deploy that application on another node, provided that you haven't uh, created any sort of tolerations or any sort of um, policies that disallow workloads from running other on other nodes. Kubernetes would take effect beforehand anyways. And then when the new node comes online, if there needs to be some sort of rebalancing effect, then Kubernetes could effectively take care of that as well. The second question is, can you please explain um, per what exactly namespace service account or a link would do the job? I'm not 
entirely familiar with what the question is. If, if I understand it correctly, though, is I think you're trying to know or understand the association of Z-Tunnel and the service itself. So Z-Tunnel can be uh, accommodating of multiple workloads that need to communicate with other workloads across the mesh. So it could, it could assume the identity of other nodes inside of the mesh as well, um, provided that it's a, a resource, a source resource or a source workload that's sending data, <clears throat> that's sending data, that source uh, Z-Tunnel will pick that up, assume the workload based off of its service account, and then form MTLS over to another Z-Tunnel at the destination side. So that's what the linkage is. Next question. In uh, Z-Tunnel in ambient mesh and the gateway pod in multi-cluster Kubernetes both build encrypted tunnels. One, one on layer four, Istio using MTLS, the other one on layer three, multi-cluster. Do you think both communities could work together to have just one pod doing both depending on the use case? Okay, so this is an interesting one because you're addressing two different layers of a network. You're addressing a layer where your, your data plane needs to be constructed. So your nodes in a multi-cluster environment are forming that data plane specifically for your workloads like pods or applications or services to run. So you have this, this node network layer, which is what you're trying to provide connectivity for in a multi-cluster environment, which can be achieved through the usage of uh, tunneling mechanisms, for example, like IPsec or some SD-WAN technology or some extension technology or WAN technology for that matter. And you could almost treat like all of these nodes together as if they're in a single super cluster. The reality is they could be all independent of each other, but they have IP reachability. Once that's established, the layer on top, the layer above that is the application layer where applications need a fabric to make service calls to each other is where the service mesh comes in. Now, the, the two layers actually do work together already. It's just a matter of how you perceive what your network looks like, whether it's exto exposed publicly or if it's a, a private network that you manage at an enterprise level. So there's a lot of different answers to do, do we think both communities could work together because they already are. I mean, if you think about it, the cloud environments already do this today and provide some software-defined networking, so to speak, across multiple clusters of environments. And then you would run a service mesh on top because your services need to find paths to each other and they need to communicate to each other and they also need to attest each other based off of their identity. So I hope that answers that question. Um, and then Kareem follows up with, this is for the waypoint proxy. How do you decide how many waypoint proxies you use exactly? Is it per app or per namespace? It's actually per workload. Um, so you could establish a waypoint proxy based off of the workload that you're trying to provide some sort of layer seven intelligence or some sort of canary deployment towards. You can think of it as deploying that layer seven envoy, except in the, in the sense of a waypoint, just to be able to do these advanced layer seven functions, even layer seven authorization, if that's something that you're after as well. Now, how you decide that is based off of the needs of your workloads. This could be many, and I understand that this could actually become a bit of a scale issue. And at that situation, I mean, ambient mesh at that point is a discussion where you have to have with, a, with an enterprise environment or enterprise offering or, or a commercial offering to help you address how to overcome some of the open source limitations in ambient mesh, because ambient mesh won't be able to scale the way you, you hope it would. And you would need something like what maybe Glue Mesh would offer or Glue Platform would offer to be able to achieve that level of scale. Okay, let's move on to Gateway API because actually it's another form of sustainability in my opinion. Um, and the reason why it's another form of sustainability is if we actually look back way back to when we do ingress and actually Alessandra, if you can move to the next slide. If we look back to the way we do ingress, uh, the way we did it before is we'd actually create a service uh, of type load balancer or node port or maybe cluster IP. And if we had multiple services, we'd have to consume multiple load balancer public IPs, which actually is, ex is, a, is, is an exhaustion on an available resource. IP addresses, IPv4 addresses are very, very limited, which is why we're trying to migrate and navigate towards IPv6. But that 
that conversation, that bridge is a very long bridge. It's, I mean, it's not like we can cross it immediately and overnight. There's so much that goes on in the public space, in the public internet, in the private space, in private networks. And dual stacking, you know, is a possibility, but there's also the level of comfort. Like getting folks to be comfortable with working with the IPv6 is a whole nother conversation altogether. Anyways, so to overcome a lot of these circumstances, we we have technologies like NAT or network address translation that helps with this. But the reality is to make this much more sustainable, we have to move away from having to statically plug and pin things to other other artifacts, right? So we don't want to statically create a service and then basically pin it to a particular load balancer or an IP. We, we need this to be a little bit flexible. So Alessandro, if you can move over to the next slide. If you think about how we overcame this, well, the ingress resource presented itself as a as a capability where we could overload a single load balancer with multiple ports and respond uh, to different services on those different ports or different backends or paths, right? So it, it was a great way to handle something like this. But the reality is ingress in itself added another layer of complexity because the way we would consume a load balancer isn't always going to be the same across every single provider. So you have to layer in annotations and annotations become very sprawly, so to speak. So you have annotations in a lot of your different ingress configurations to decide and dictate how that load balancer should accept and listen in for traffic. So there are ways to overcome this, obviously. And the way Istio did it was through the Istio ingress gateway, where you, you, know, you had this gateway artifact and you would create virtual gateways to expose different services into the mesh uh, from the outside world. And this is how it overcame the ingress challenge, the ingress challenge of using annotations and the, the, the nature of having to maintain those over time. So now, if we actually think about, uh, sorry, Alessandro, if we could move to the next slide. If we really think about sustainability, the way around this is, if we don't want to have to deal with annotations, we can deal with gateway classes instead and conform to a common standard that all ingress providers would conform to. So what does that mean? I mean, that means that Kubernetes will present a common standard called the Gateway API standard, which means that you could define the way you expose your apps or your HTTP routes and inject things like TLS and whatnot in a certain way that is consistent regardless of the ingress provider that you choose or that you use. So for example, if today I decide I want to use a basic ingress controller like Nginx, uh, but it offers up the gateway API functionality and down the line I decide I want something a little bit more advanced, well, that gateway class offers the swap ability to say today I will use Nginx, tomorrow I will use Istio or the Istio service mesh and specifically maybe even ambient mesh. Now, what, what actually changes here is the way you would approach how you expose services. So, uh, Alessandro, if we can get to that next slide. So it's the way and structure of how we think about this. So we have a gateway class, and that is tied to a particular role within an organization who decides and dictates what infrastructure should look like, meaning I'm going to pick and choose Kubernetes as my container orchestration and API system. And then simultaneously, I'm, I'm going to pick something like Istio as my service mesh that's going to provide gateway functionality. And then you have some other personas that exist there to decide how these, these artifacts can be consumed and then what is actually truly consumed. For example, the cluster operator will say, OK, I'm going to spin up a gateway that says and exposes services listening in on this domain name. Well, an app developer says, okay, this is the specific service, and this is what I want to be listening in on based off of this HTTP route. So let's actually look at this in an expressive format and see what this looks like. Next slide, please. So if you look at the traditional ingress resource, we have uh, you know, a name, some standard metadata. We have a host, which actually is our my.analytics.example.com domain. We have a path that we're trying to get to and a particular port number. You have another path as well, and then another port number that ensures that we get to that right destination. 
but this is specific to one ingress controller. Meaning if, if that limit is limited in functionality and I decide to swap, I actually have to make some changes to make this possible. So that actually moves over to this new format where we have two resources that are spun up, the gateway resource, which effectively is, is allowing us to decide who is the gateway provider. So it could be Nginx or it could be Istio as the gateway provider. And then additionally, helping us decide how we're exposing these, these services inside of our cluster, right? So for example, this backend service foo.service is going to be exposed through this gateway, which we've created up here called gateway one, right? In the, in the foo namespace. And the interesting thing is it's going to listen in on port 80, which is very much like what we're seeing here. And right? we're listening in on port 80, except, I mean, this is not the exact same example, but we are listening in through one gateway and we're, we have a route, an HTTP route to know where that, that service exactly lives, foo service to Kubernetes service. So next slide, please. Now, Gateway API itself is still in development. It went GA in early November. So there's a lot of different capabilities that is still being worked on. Right now, you can you can actually leverage the HTTP route functionality. There are some experimental resources like the TCP route and UDP route, as well as TLS and GRPC routes. But these are still a work in progress. There's a lot of development that is underway. So what does this mean, right? I decide I want to deploy a gateway that is originating from Istio. So I have to tell the gateway class is it's going to be Istio. When I specify my gateway resource, it's going to pull that gateway class. And then I'm also going to specify an HTTP route that exposes whatever service in Kubernetes that I want to expose. And that leverages this gateway or specifically the Istio gateway to be able to reach that resource. So there is a question here. Can the gateway also handle egress as well? Or can gateway can handle egress also? So actually, gateway API, I'm not sure. Can it handle egress? I don't believe it can. Specifically, if you were just using gateway API as a, as a resource, I don't think it handles egress. It's more for ingress. Specifically in Istio, however, if you deploy the egress gateway, you can you can do egress functionality. I yeah I agree with that. So this using gateway API doesn't mean that you don't have all the Istio resources at your disposal, right? So uh, they keep working. They just handle by the Istio controller, the Istio control plane. So yes, there is no egress as far as I know uh, within the spec of gateway API. But because you are using a controller like Istio, then you have all the power of uh, Istio that you can still use but you have to use Istio-specific resources, that's it. Exactly, so uh, that that's exactly on point. There's a lot of work that needs to be done on the gateway API front for, a, for it to be able to handle egress as well. And so that's answered. And then another one from Kareem, this seems to be a replacement for Kubernetes ingress, but how is this related to Istio gateway as it ties to virtual service? So actually this is interesting and I'm gonna show you a demonstration about this. So Istio does have this concept of a virtual service, and it also has the functionality to support the HTTP route, which is essentially a virtual service. Now, interestingly enough, uh, yes, while Gateway API is a replacement for Kubernetes Ingress or the Ingress resource, uh, the Kubernetes Ingress resource will still be available for some additional versions and eventually will become deprecated, ensuring that folks move over to the Gateway API spec. Now, uh, having said that, right, the virtual service is, is a mechanism in Istio that allows us to expose a Kubernetes service. So it allows us to overload a single gateway in, in multiple ways, or even expose services to other services inside of a mesh in a unique way. The Istio gateway specifically, right, Kareem? The Istio gateway specifically um, is part of the gateway class. So it's a, it's a gateway that you would specify in the gateway class. That, it, that gateway class can be something else as well. Like there are different kinds of gateway classes. And um, in fact, I can even pull this up. I'm going to do a quick Google, well not Google search. I'll go look at the uh, different gateway classes inside of Kubernetes docs and hopefully we'll find something inside of there. 
but there are a few providers out there that support uh, the gateway class at the moment. Um, anyways, we'll, we'll come back to that and we'll revisit that. Now, having said that, let's actually go take a look at the demo because this actually allows us to dig into how we can use the gateway API as well as ambient mesh. So Alessandro, if you don't mind to stop sharing your screen for a second and I can go ahead and share my screen. Perfect. Let me know if you can see that Alessandro and everyone else. Perfect, perfect. So I'm also going to link to a document. I hope that everyone can see the chat and if you cannot, let's find another way to share that document. But the document actually calls out the different implementations of Gateway API, either from a service mesh standpoint or other kind of node or gateway standpoint. So you should be able to better understand who out there is providing these services. For example, um, Istio is a provider. There are other providers out there. And in fact, if um, Alessandra, if you want to be able to link to some of them, you know, feel free to. I will. Actually, I, will. I was yeah. just answering a question. Yes. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. So what do I have here? I have a simple Kubernetes cluster. So kubectl get nodes dash a kind, nothing special. Um, and I'm also going to just enumerate all the pods here dash o dash a. And we can notice that we've got a bunch of different pods. So I'll briefly explain some of the more critical ones because the rest of them don't really care too much about right now. So we have Istio D. I mean, we're all very familiar with Istio D. It is the control plane for Istio, the Istio service mesh. So any sort of configuration we pass to it is, is actually understood by the Kubernetes API. Um, Istio D will process those configurations and translate them into Kubernetes resources for us. So that you know, a lot of the heavy lifting is automatically taken care of. Now, we also have two new artifacts. In fact, let's get pods in the Istio system namespace and just look at them a little bit more carefully. I'll make this a little bit bigger so that y'all can see. Now, we have one called the Istio CNI, and we also have one called Z Tunnel. So, as Alessandro previously mentioned, the Z Tunnel is the quote unquote, node level slash remote proxy that is handling requests on behalf of any applications. Meaning I have a number of these applications and if they need to make a request outbound, I mean, I only have one node right now, but if they need to make a request outbound, then what would end up happening is it actually communicate through this Z tunnel. And then the Z tunnel would form a TLS or an MTLS based tunnel towards another Z tunnel where the workloads get terminated. Actually, ideally we'd, we'd wanna have multiple environments to demonstrate this functionality, but that's, or multiple nodes I should say, so that you could see some of the other um, Z tunnels pop up, but that's okay, right? I think for, for what we wanna describe here, we also wanna get into a little bit of the gateway API, but if you notice something very interesting, if you look at the pods here in the test namespace, actually, if we do a kubectl, get, get pods and test. And I will answer you in a second, Kareem, because um, I want everyone to, to hear some of my thoughts around that. Now, if you notice here, I do have Istio running. In fact, all of these, if I do a kubectl get ns dash dash show labels, I, I do have Istio running. If you also look at the test namespace, I do not have a um, configuration yet for putting these nodes in the mesh, right? They are putting these pods in the mesh. And actually there's just one simple configuration that makes that possible. It's a simple label. Um, and it's basically just telling ambient mesh or Istio D that when it detects a namespace, um, when it detects a namespace with the ambient mesh label, then it's a part of the mesh. It's a part of the mesh. Because what's interesting is if you think about if you think about IPsec for a second, IPsec is a very, 
you know, kind of pseudo interesting technology, but also in a lot of ways, we still use it. Um, we use it because, you know, we still need to connect nodes together, right? We still need to connect clusters together. Now, if I, if I proceeded to want these workloads, right, in the test namespace to be able to be part of the mesh and be MTLS encrypted by ZTunnel, then I need to label the namespace with istio.io forward slash data plane mode equals ambient. The moment I do that, and if I hit up arrow again, right, notice that that test namespace has the ambient mesh label, which now also means that all of these workloads are part of the mesh. Do they have sidecars? No, they don't have sidecars. So now anytime they make any call to another service in another cluster or another environment or another node, it should tra it should basically traverse the mesh or traverse the Z tunnels. Now, what's interesting is within a mesh or within a node, I should specifically say, these workloads won't specifically have to traverse the Z tunnel. So, all right, let's take a look at exposing some of these services. Now, if I did a Actually, that's not what I wanted to do. There we go. So let's take a look at this. I'm actually sharing the mechanism in which I would expose the web API um, resource. And if you notice, I would have used the Istio Ingress gateway to do that, but I'm actually using the gateway API spec. And if you notice the API backend is a Kubernetes API backend. It's not, it's not an Istio backend. But if you also notice here, right, it's being deployed inside of the Istio system namespace and the gateway class name is Istio, which means I am telling Kubernetes to use Istio's ingress gateway to listen in for requests coming in to Istio explain.io on port 8080. Now, uh, Kareem asked earlier about a virtual service resource and its association to the Istio Ingress Gateway. Well, I'm still using Istio's Ingress Gateway, except I'm using the Gateway Kubernetes resource or the Gateway API resource. And I'm using another Kubernetes resource called the HTTP route, which is exactly, almost verbatim, the virtual service. I mean, there might be some slight variant, very variances here around spacing and like the ordering of stuff, but quite honestly, it, it looks almost the same, right? I have a host name that I'm listening on and I have rules to tell me how to match this. So right now I'm just going to any backend path, but specifically if I'm listening in on this web API gateway that I specified up here and I need to, I need to go to a particular service, I've already defined it here as a route, right? The service is web API on port 8080. So the moment I deploy this, I should be able to respond to requests on port 8080 for istio.io. So let's go ahead and deploy this. So I have this somewhere here. So that's been deployed. And I also have my curl, so control R curl. Actually, before I do that, Okay, and then if I do an echo of my gateway API, I just wanna make sure that there is perfect. And then we're gonna quickly curl and this should work. And it did. So that's gateway API in action, actually. So what, what we just witnessed here is that if I did a kubectl get gateways, right? There's nothing there because I didn't specify the namespace. If I did a dash n istio system, right? kubectl get gateways dash n istio system. This is a Kubernetes resource. This is very similar to an istio gateway resource, but this is the exact same definition. 
you're listening for requests on a specific host on a specific port and uh, that's going to be associated with a route that route once it receives those requests is going to direct it and wire it directly to the service that is in kubernetes so now the other thing we want to do is get the http route and there's nothing in the default namespace so if i do test dash n test i think it should be there i think that's where i deployed it to and there it is so there's my HTTP route, which also in a lot of ways resembles the virtual service. If I describe it, right, kubectl, kubectl, describe route web API, oops, it's web API, yeah, dash n test. There we go. So that's the actual web API, HTTP route, quote unquote, virtual service, if you were in the Istio world, but very similar format, you know, where we're using the gateway, the web API gateway to listen for requests, and we're directing them to the web API service. So that's gateway API in action. Now, why, why is this sustainable? Why is this important? Because later on down the line, if you decide, not that we, I would ever want you to leave us, right, leave this deal, but let's just decide there's something that is a little bit different, or maybe you decide you want to migrate to, to Glue's enterprise offering and use theirs. Well, the gateway class can be swapped to Glue at some point. And that makes transitioning easier to a much more enterprise-ready solution. So there's a lot of ways you can think about it. Glue platform offers all of this, by the way. Uh, Glue Gateway also offers the Gateway API functionality, although is very much in lockstep with open source Envoy at the moment. Um, not Istio, by the way, if you just don't want Istio, well, there's Glue Gateway, which does focus on Envoy specifically. But there are ways for you to start thinking about how you can onboard the Gateway API into your environment in a very sustainable manner without you having to rewrite and rebuild a whole bunch of stuff. So... Having said that, uh, I'm going to pass it back to Alessandro so that we can summarize and wrap up and open up for any sort of QA. Thank you, Madino. Uh, yes, and the, there was this uh, CNI CNI question that I answered already. Uh, thank you for 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 that. Uh, uh, for that, oh yeah, uh, actually, sorry. I, uh, I'd love to yeah. answer that too, if you don't mind. So the Istio CNI, I wanted to go into a little bit more detail about that, and I kind of overlooked it. The Istio CNI is used in Ambient Mesh to help with redirecting the traffic and identifying the traffic that needs to be ambient or, or mesh bound specifically. So for example, if I have service A trying to communicate with service B on another node and it's mesh bound, well, the Z tunnel does the carrying of the traffic, it carries the request and it forms the tunnel. But we have to find a way to navigate that traffic towards that tunnel. So this is what the Istio CNI is doing. It's navigating that traffic towards Z tunnel so that it can be encapsulated and then sent over the quote unquote wire. It is not a replacement for the CNI that is required to run Kubernetes and run pods inside of Kubernetes and get IP addresses in an IPAM fashion. Yeah, yeah. In fact, in fact, CNIs are uh, um, you can have multiple CNIs. They are in uh, chain together. So that's exactly what Istio CNI does. Is it gets in the chain and just for those pods that are part of the mesh uh, manipulates the IP tables. If is that's what you're using or EBF eBPF programs. If uh, this is what you're using, so so that would be would be great. So let's conclude. It was a great uh, great demo. Thank you. Um, to go back to, of course, the choices that we all make. Uh, uh, you do have a choice. It's not. I'm not saying that you have to go out out now and uh, uh, adopt service mesh, in particular uh, ambient mesh, right today. But you know that everything, every choice you make, even not making a choice, even don't uh, not caring or not postponing, is a choice in itself. So it's um, so what we want to say. Um, there is a better way to think about this. In fact, there are other um, um, projections that instead of uh, 
uh, a sim um, asymptotic uh, expansion and consumption of resources uh, kind of levels out and we can learn how to do more with less, uh, do more, don't stop progress and innovation, but still uh, make sure that our kids uh, have a future and uh, and all the unborn uh, <laughs> future generation have a, have a great place to, to be, which is a clean, efficient planet where we can all live together in peace forever. So how to contribute to, to open source uh, and to specifically to the tag uh, environment sustainability, join uh, join the meeting, join the meetings, uh, find us on um, on Slack and uh, bring your ideas. We that's all we need. You know, that's uh, or at least that's where we start from ideas and contribution and uh, participation. So there are other projects you should check out. The Carbon Aware CADA operator. I would love to see this also working together with with Istio, maybe we'll we'll uh, have some more webinars in the future. But it's a way to understand the the carbon intensity for your uh, for your Kubernetes clusters and uh, be uh, do something about it. Very interesting project. We as a community, we all love to go to Kube, to KubeCon, and we have a new initiative for um, well reducing the impact of our travel kubetrain.io, it's where uh, you can find more information on part of that. So we all look forward to join uh, Kubecon in Paris, but without uh, polluting and without flying. Uh, Europe allows people to, to move by train. So have a, have a look. If you want to know more about Ambient, for sure, check out uh, free resources on our website uh, and join the Istio community calls that been recently started again. And... Uh, uh, yeah, please join the community of Vistu. Uh, we all need your uh, your 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 contribution. Uh, so Academy, you want to have more hands on on this? Please be part of it. It's it's uh, uh, you get nice badges to show on your LinkedIn and uh, uh, and your uh, your profile. We have a Slack, so we always uh, welcome people to come find us there, but also on the CNCF Slack. And I will thank you uh, for being here today. And Madino, of course, and uh, and Candice and Samantha. Yes, thank you everyone for your time today. Really appreciate it. If you have any questions for us, you can find us on Slack, slack.solo.io. And again, a lot of a lot of this uh, is available as hands-on at academy.solo.io as well. Uh, what's interesting is that little environment that I was showing you is using Instruct. It was also the same ambient mesh lab environment that that is also available to you for you to be able to test out how ZTunnel works, how Waypoint works, understand the routing behind it, and then even work with Gateway API. And there are some other things too, as well as network foundations. If if you need a little bit more understanding around how TCP IP and DNS and, and HTTP function inside of Kubernetes. But again, thank you so much everyone for your time today. We hope to see you again on, on another webinar. Take care. See ya. Thank you so much, Alessandra and Marino, for your time today. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today. We hope you join us for future webinars. Have a wonderful day.